Okay, so my recorder decided to die on me in the middle of my discussion of female genital mutilation. So I'm just going to kind of repeat it in case the recorder was off for a while. Um, so these would be procedures that intentionally alter or cause injury to the female genital organs. And um, they are performed in other places besides Africa. There are certain um, what are called clitorodectomies that are performed in India also. Um, but the thing about these um, ones that in particular are pr practiced in Africa is that it seems to be intended to ensure the virginity of females. And so, um, and then also the, um, the continued um, purity of a wife or something. And so it may be done when they're little, like this little girl is having done, by her own mother, because her own mother realizes that she's not going to be as valuable at marriage age as she would be if she doesn't have this done, as she would be if she had it done. So her own mom is doing this. And what the goal is, is to sort of scar up, you know, sort of um, make raw the um, labia minora so that they'll seal together. And if done properly, according to their practices, um, it, they would leave an opening for urine and leave an opening for, enough of an opening for, for menstrual flow. Um, and then the, the, the husband's job is to open this scarred shut um, opening at, um, on their wedding night and then he's assured that his bride it can't possibly be pregnant or um, soiled or whatever um, and of course I've got here some of the the problems the significant um, issues that are associated with this practice it's um, it's nothing it's nothing like male circumcision because of the uh, first off the intention behind the procedure is not in any way shape or form arguably uh, medical benefit for the girls. In fact, it's a medical detriment for the girls. Um, and then the intention behind it as far as making her more valuable and things like that is it's nothing like uh, male circumcision. And then of course it's done on the dirty ground with a here this mom at least has a razor blade. Sometimes they'll use broken glass and they'll use all sorts of things that they'll that they have on hand because it needs to be done. It's a big ritual and the the group all grad, um, gathers around because they all need to see that it's happening so that they all know that this girl is um, going to be a valuable wife. So I mean it's a completely different thing and you know the um, the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, the UN, um, everybody's trying to put pressure on these countries to stop this practice, but it's really difficult to get people's cultures to change and so um, to get people's mindsets to change about what it would mean to have a daughter who hasn't been altered like this. And then like I mentioned, in some countries they have clitoridectomies where the intention is to just remove any sexual pleasure. So they'll actually remove the clitoris. In other countries, um, the practice is to remove the hood over the clitoris so that the, clitor the it can't do its job. So that during arousal when normally it would come and cover the clitoris so that it's st it, it continues to be pleasurable and not abrasive or aversive, um, they remove the hood and then now sex isn't pleasurable. Um, so these are, are alterations of the female um, genitals that are intended to remove sexual pleasure or to ensure virginity or other kinds of things. Um, let's move on to something less gruesome. Um, although I'm not, I got to say this picture is probably not a huge improvement. Um, <laughs> these are the breasts. And um, so what you can see in, a, in an adult female after uh, maturation is the yellow blobs are fat. And this is one of the things that happens during puberty is the laying down of fat in the breast area. Some people lay down more fat and some people lay down less fat. And so um, that helps to account for variations in breast size. Um, everybody, you know, pretty much has the same milk making capacity. That would be the purple structures. It's not, um, it's not, it doesn't matter how large your breasts are. The, it's the uh, memory tissue that makes the milk. So first structure, you'll just have to memorize this one because I'm sure you've never heard that scientific word before, right? Nipple. Um, the brown area around the nipple is called the areola and it contains some, sometimes l some hair follicles um, to the chagrin of women, but it's pretty normal. Um, it also has these bumps that are quite mysterious to women. They're like, what are these bumps on my nipples? And the, um, those bumps on the areola actually secrete a fluid that lubricates the nipple during nursing. It can also be um, secreted during arousal. Um, when there, there's a series, there's a hormonal cascade that can cause the secretion of the fluids out of the areola. It also, from those same orifices, we secrete pheromones 
that are um, detectable by males. So, and males secrete them around their nipples and they're, they're detectable by females. So all of us have these, um, these apocrine glands that secrete fluid out of the uh, areola and actually just dissipate, they sort of dissipate um, molecules that other people can detect. The milk duct is that where those purple blobby things sort of come together with a little bulge and that's where um, a baby who's nursing would compress on those in a way that is um, amazing how babies come out with this reflex knowing how to exactly work the milk duct and that causes the letdown of the milk from um, the milk lobes and causes milk to actually come out the nipple. Now the nipple doesn't have one hole in it like a baby bottle. The nipple has several holes. They usually are not visible until a woman has lactated or had a baby and then they become vis visible. Um, so it's kind of hard to find them but there's there are several. They're around they're like in the middle and around the ring uh, in a ring around the edges of the nipple. Um, so then there's the fat globules. Okay so that's what makes up a breast. Now males have these same structures. It's not just the areola and the nipple. Males actually have the potential to have milk lobes and milk ducts. They have the potential to lay down fat. They usually don't. Um, usually testosterone at puberty prevents the development of the milk lobes, the milk ducts, and the fat laying down. Um, but so here's a picture of the male breast on the left and the female breast on the right. Um, all the stuff sort of like atrophied in, um, in males and instead they have the fluffiness that they have in their chest would be usually attributable to muscle mass because they tend to build up their pectoral muscles larger than females do. Um, so when you look at um, the difference between male and female breasts, they have the same stuff but testosterone usually undermines the development of the female version. I say usually because there can be times when males experience what's called gynecomastia and that's where um, they may lay down fat where females would normally lay down fat. They ha may have rudimentary glandular tissue. They may actually develop milk glands and could actually have milk coming out of their nipples. Um, you might have heard of the class action suit against um, the makers of, uh, hold on, I know the name of it. Um, it's an antipsychotic medication that's sometimes given to, to kids for other reasons and um, it can cause gynecomastia that doesn't go away even if you stop taking the medication. Um, other things that can cause gynecomastia are um, marijuana use, um, other kinds of glandular issues, endocrine based issues can also cause it. So let me go through my little list. Um, it can be, you know, it can be really normal. A lot. This is very embarrassing for teenage boys who experience this. Um, it happens at infancy. A lot of times, baby boys will be born with very swollen nipples because they've been exposed to mom's hormones in the womb. It can happen again at puberty when they're starting to go through their, um, you know, the addition of testosterone can cause their nipples to swell, and it can be really embarrassing for boys. And a lot of times, all of a sudden, they don't want to wear shirt. They don't want to go shirtless at the beach. Um, they don't want to shower at the at the high school with everybody else because um, they think that they're just completely abnormal. But it's um, usually transitory in teenage boys. It can be a sign of aging. As we age, sometimes our hormone pattern changes, and so then we can end up with um, more feminization. Certain medications, um, like I mentioned, we have the um, Risperidol. I finally remembered the brand name of the medication that's being sued. It's been associated with gynecomastia. Steroids can cause gynecomastia, which is pretty funny to think, you know, but I'm not talking about anabolic steroids. I'm talking about steroids that you might be prescribed because of um, arthritis or um, certain kinds of allergies, things like that. Antibiotics can cause it, anxiety medication, depression medication, heart medications can cause it. So there are a lot of things that can actually cause gynecomastia. Um, like I said, marijuana has been associated with uh, gynecomastia. Um, a lot of street drugs and alcohol have been associated. Of course, anytime you're putting on extra weight because of stuff that you're using, you could also end up having fat deposited in um, areas that you don't like. So it might not be gynecomastia as much as it is just I got overall fatter. Um, so it's kind of health conditions. I mean that's not the world's most flattering picture of poor Jack Nicholson but I mean there are things that can cause um, the development of fat depositing around the breasts of men that um, you know it may if you don't have a simple explanation like you've gained weight or um, something like that it, it's worth seeing your doctor about other poss possible causes. Alright, internal structures. 
Okay, so we've got a cross section, so we can see all the body parts on the left, and then we've got sort of a zoom in from another angle on the right. Okay, so let's start on the left. We're going to, like we started with the male with the sperm, let's start with the female with the egg. So here's an ovary. Um, on the female, we have an, you know, an ovary on either side, just like males have two testicles. This is just a cross cut, so we're only seeing one of the ovaries. The ovaries contain all the eggs that the female's ever going to have when she's born. In fact, she was actually, she contained more eggs while in the womb than she's actually born with. Um, some of them get um, sort of um, deleted before birth, but then she carries with her all her potential progeny for the rest of her life. Um, so all of them are in there. They have to ripen and stuff like that, and that, we're going to talk about that in a little bit later. Now that little hand that's sort of on the top of the ovary is called the fimbria, and that's actually a, uh, um, a set of finger-like protuberances that move in response to the woman's heartbeat and to motion, stuff like that. And, and what they do is they cause a little bit of a suction motion towards the um, fallopian tube so that when an egg is released, those fimbria help to direct the egg into the fallopian tube. So the fallopian tube it, um, would be the place where sperm are now swimming as fast as they can if there was an ejaculation recently um, to try and meet the egg. Um, so an egg that gets fertilized is now going to move down the fallopian tube to the uterus for implantation. The uterus every month gets ready for a possible implantation and then every month that an implantation doesn't occur it sheds all those preparations and that's what we call menstruation. So we're going to talk about that in another chapter or later in this chapter, I can't remember. Anyway, so if you look at the um, structures that had been the external structures in the previous picture, like for example the clitoris, see the um, extent to which the clitoris is rooted in the female body? It's got that little bit that sticks out and at erection, at arousal, it actually becomes erect and gets filled with blood and it causes more of the clitoris to protrude out into the vaginal, you know, into the vulva openings. Um, this is an unaroused woman. Uh, so there's a lot inside though and if you look at the picture on the right you can see where the glands protrudes out, there's the hood there and then you can see there are actually roots that go on either side um, going you know around the urethra and going around the vagina on either side of the body. So it's pretty well rooted in the body. Um, what else is interesting? So um, you can see the vagina coming from you know the vaginal opening that we had seen in the previous picture up to meet the uterus and right now you really get a good picture of how it's a potential space it's it just looks like flat right now um, but it can expand not only large enough to you know uh, accommodate fingers or a penis or something like that but it can it can ultimately accommodate a baby whose um, head is going to be 10 centimeters at, uh, in diameter that means across at birth. So it's a very um, stretchable and then it can return back to its basically normal state after um, after having stretched. So I think I hit the high points. That big opening in the back there, that that's the rectum, so that's really not related um, too much. Although um, we'll talk about the um, muscles surrounding the rectum, the vagina, and the urethra later. Okay, so I think I hit all the main structures. Um, so let's talk about some issues. Endometriosis. So we talked about the uterus and how it gets prepared for um, a potential implantation every month. Well in endometriosis you don't have only um, your uterus lined with cells that are going to get ready for a pregnancy but you have those cells in other parts of your body. Um, so here's a picture of a healthy, normally functioning, um, normally designed, everything's the way it's supposed to be, kind of um, female internal organs. And here you can see the, that you've got ovaries on both sides, fallopian tubes on both sides. Um, in a in a endometriosis case, what you see on this out, on the outside of this uterus is um, pieces of endometrial tissue. The endometrial lining, the endometrium, is that part of the uterus that normally builds up in anticipation for a pregnancy and then gets discarded during menstruation. Um, how we can end up with endometrial tissue on the outside of the uterus is a subject of debate. The most common theory is what's called the back flush theory, where the idea is that when menstruating, 
instead of all of the endometrial tissue going downward and out the opening of the of the cervix and out into the vagina um, some of it backed up into the fallopian tubes and came out those fimbria and found their way into the abdomen this is a picture of just a uterus with um, endometrial tissue on them that actually can migrate to um, your intestines it can get up onto other organs so um, it can migrate around in the abdomen so here's a picture that shows some of the common areas where it might migrate to um, so and you can imagine if it got if if the endometrial tissue got back flushed out the fimbria and then floated around in the um, pelvic region there are a lot of places for it to adhere to and then here's the weird thing it'll adhere and then every month from now on it's going to swell and cause pain when the rest of the endometrial layer is swelling so it's responding to the hormones like it always should and but it's attached to the wrong structures so it causes pain during menstru um, during the buildup and then when it's supposed to be being shed it causes significant cramping and and pain um, so endometriosis um, also we have issues of ovarian cysts um, ovarian cysts are when here we again have a healthy um, female structures um, when you can actually get the buildup of like a water balloon when your um, egg is supposed to be rupturing out of the follicle um, at ovulation instead of rupturing out a, a, like a water balloon starts to develop and it get, fills with fluid and becomes significantly painful and then when it finally bursts it hurts really badly but then you do feel better afterwards but while you're waiting for it it's very painful um, so this is called a follicular cyst and that's how that works um, a co corpus luteum cyst is where you have um, eggs that are still in their um, corpus luteum they aren't ready to be released yet they're, they're still waiting their turn to even mature and you're getting these kinds of water balloon issues in these uh, immature um, luteum that um, can interfere with uh, ovulation and can cause a lot of pain if you know anybody who has been diagnosed with poly polycystic ovarian syndrome they have corpus luteum cysts where they have poly means many um, cysts polycystic many cysts um, in their ovaries ovarian syndrome and so it can alter your hormonal patterns it can make it very difficult to become pregnant when you want to it can um, cause you to stop menstruating it can cause you to lose your hair it can do all sorts of things to your hormones um, so these are fairly rare but um, you know common enough that I thought it was worth mentioning because some people in class might have some of these symptoms and might have these uh, have been diagnosed with these and um, you know a lot of times the cure for these is to take hormonal birth control that may or may not work um, and then when you t stop taking it, it the symptoms may come back sometimes it goes away the best cure they have is actually having a baby but that can be really super hard because you're not necessarily ovulating so it's all quite a quite a difficult situation all right let's go ahead and take a break because we got to talk about the menstrual cycle and this may take a while so